he is willing to do this, wanting to turn his own daughter into a young widow and rip her husband away from her. And he knows that she really loves him because that's the whole reason that this trap will work. He knows that she really does have this affection. He's willing to break his own daughter's heart to get what he wants. Saul's come a long way from where he was earlier in the scripture. To where really the only thing that does matter to him is him. Hey there, fellow tacticians. Don't forget to like and subscribe and ring that little notification bell because the more likes and subscriptions I get, the more people see my conservative content, which will make America a better place and angers the dark cyber overlords at YouTube. In 1775, the Continental Congress created the Chaplain Corps. Under the command of General George Washington, each soldier was required to attend worship service every Sunday. While other armies advanced on their feet, Washington's troops advanced on their knees. It's time for The Chaplain's Report with Caleb Colquitt on tactics. Today's Chaplain's Report, we will be continuing our series in the book of 1 Samuel. For those of you that may not have been around for the last Chaplain's Report, Saul is now plotting against David. So we have moved from Saul being, or sorry, David being part of Saul's inner circle, being basically somebody that's like a member of the family. He's his son's best friend. He's buddies with the all the people in the castle. He's gained some fame and notoriety around the country. He's actually doing missions and going out and fighting people in the name of Saul. And so he's gone from being part of Saul's inner circle to technically still part of Saul's inner circle, but also somebody that Saul has repeatedly tried to kill. And so this is not a good place for David to be. He is in danger because the king of Israel, the most powerful man in the country, is seeking his life. But so far, he has not only had no success, but everything that Saul has done to try to kill David or make him fall out of faith, it's actually only done the opposite. It's only had him gain more favor in the sight of all of the people around him. He has gained more fame. He has become more noble and more people like him, even though Saul was trying to do the exact opposite in sending him out. He was trying to get him killed by sending him out into battle. And we see sort of that same theme continuing on here in 1 Samuel 18, verses 17 through 19. Then Saul said to David, Here is my older daughter, Merib. I will give her to you as a wife. Only be a valiant man for me and fight the Lord's battles. For Saul thought, My hand shall not be against him, but let the hand of the Philistines be against him. But David said to Saul, Who am I, and who is my family or my father's family, Israel, that I should be the king's son-in-law? So it came about at the time that Merib, Saul's daughter, was to be given to David, that she was given instead to Adriel, the Methshebabite, as a wife. You know, David is just absolutely awed by this. He is shocked and honored that Saul is even considering him as being a member of his family, to, to marry into their family and be the son-in-law. David's just sitting around like, I'm from some backwater hick town out in Bethlehem. My family's not famous. We're not rich. We're not renowned. And in the tribe of Judah, it's true that Judah is a very large and strong tribe, but it also means there's a whole lot of people that just aren't that famous. It's kind of like being a, a, a decent-sized fish, but if you're in the ocean, nobody's going to notice you. But David's family isn't even that. They're a little bitty fish in a really big pond. And so David, who has a very humble upbringing, he spends pretty much all of his time with sheep. He's just flabbergasted by this idea that the king might actually want him to marry into his family. And that's a reasonable reaction to what has just happened here. He's basically being invited to be part of Israel's royalty. That's a big deal for him. But... Understand with that, that Saul doesn't keep his word. I think that Saul knows that doing that would only make David more famous and seem more like he had a legitimate claim to the throne, which 
isn't really rolling around in David's heads right, right now, but the scripture tells us it's absolutely the all-consuming thing that is in the forefront of Saul's mind. He is horribly worried and paranoid about David taking over his throne. And so the reason that you see this event where Saul promises David to, to be his son-in-law and marry his daughter, but then all of a sudden backs out at the last second and has her marry another guy, it's probably because he just, as he says in this verse, he wants the Philistines' hands to be against him. So he wants to basically hold his daughter out there as bait and say, hey, if you, you do what I ask you to, you go out, you kill a bunch of Philistines, you work in my army, I'll give you my wife. And then David goes out and does a bunch of that stuff. And then, oh, uh, yeah, sorry, we, we kind of forgot about that. We just kind of married her off to this other guy. See, that's what's happening here. Saul wants to hold her out as bait, but he doesn't want to actually give her to David because when he does that, he knows that that will just strengthen the seemingly uh, the, the seeming tie to and, and claim to the throne for him. And so Saul is not only deceptive in the sense that he's trying to kill David, but he's also deceptive in his word as well, that he's trying to simultaneously act like, oh yeah, David, and we're such good friends. Also, go out and do a whole bunch of stuff for me that's very risky so you might die. Obviously, that's not what he's revealing here, but he's trying to, to have it both ways. He's trying to make it seem like they're very close, and simultaneously, and from a strategical perspective, it's actually very smart that he's keeping his enemies close like this, or at least someone he perceives as an enemy in this sense. But I think that this should reveal a couple things to us. First of all, Saul is still way too concerned about what people think about him. Because again, he is the king. If he wanted to just kill David, he could. But this is one case where being concerned about what other people think about you is actually leading to a good result. Now, the intent of his heart is the same. His sin is the same. As Jesus reveals to us in the Sermon on the Mount, contemplating and, and scheming of killing somebody in your heart is just as bad as doing it in real life because the evil is still there inside of you. But he's not going to just come out and straight kill David because he is still concerned about what other people think of him. And so because of that, he is trying to take this sort of half-hearted approach. But at least that is the, the sort of social responsibility is keeping Saul from acting out his darkest impulses. But it should also reveal to us the evil that is done cleverly is just as evil as evil that is done obviously. Because this is a pretty clever scheme that Saul puts forth. And David essentially does the same thing with Uriah. Years later, when David wants to have Uriah's wife, he strategically sends Uriah out to battle so that he might be killed and then his wife would be available. It's a horrible thing and a terrible time in David's life where he basically becomes Saul for a little while and does a similar thing. They both do it very shrewdly and cleverly, but ultimately, the evil is just as bad if they had done it themselves. In fact, we have David actually understanding this and repenting that he says that it is as if his own sword is the one that pierced Uriah. You see, whether you do it shrewdly and, and do sort of the Rube Goldberg approach where you get the end that you want to, but you do evil to try to get the result that you're wanting, that's just as bad as if you do it yourself, obviously, to where everybody can see. And so Saul doing this, it's no less evil than what David does and, and actually succeeds at, or, or no less evil than if he had just gone out and killed David himself. So let's go ahead and look at Samuel, 1 Samuel 18, verses 20 through 22, the follow-up to this. Now, Michal, Saul's daughter, loved David. When they informed Saul, the thing was pleasing to him. For Saul thought, I will give her to him so that she may become a trap for him and that the hand of the Philistines may be against him. Therefore Saul said to David, For a second time you may become my son-in-law today. Then Saul commanded his servants, Speak to David in secret, saying, Behold, the king delights in you, and all his servants love you. Now then, become the king's son-in-law. 
So now Saul has already offered one daughter to David and then taken that offer back and had her marry somebody else and then finds out that he has another daughter that fancies David and goes, hmm, maybe I could use her as a trap for him as well. I want you to take a step back and think about this. This is a man that is so consumed with envy and pride and paranoia to try to protect his own throne, his own power, and his own position and prestige. He is willing to use his own daughters as pawns. And by the way, he actually winds up using Jonathan as a pawn as well. This is a man that doesn't mind using his own children, knowing that they will be hurt, in order to get his way. Think about this. He wants to marry off this youngest daughter. I'm sure he didn't really want to marry her off to him, but he's willing to do it is the point. So he takes Machal, and he is willing to have her marry off to a man that he is hoping will die and be killed by Philistines. He is okay with making his own daughter a widow, with having her go through all of the pomp and circumstance and ceremony of being with him and falling in love with him, only to hope and then later actually try to facilitate himself, because he does do that eventually. He goes to where he's just straight on hunting David and trying to kill him. He is willing to do this, wanting to turn his own daughter into a young widow and rip her husband away from her. And he knows that she really loves him because that's the whole reason that this trap will work. He knows that she really does have this affection. He's willing to break his own daughter's heart to get what he wants. Saul's come a long way from where he was earlier in the scripture to where really the only thing that does matter to him is him. Not even members of his own family get the respect that they need and deserve from him. He's not even willing to protect his own daughters from something like this. In fact, he's willing to facilitate it. It really is a, a crying shame that somebody that started out as good and noble and, quite frankly, godly as Saul has fallen so far that now he's not even just ignoring God's commands. He doesn't even respect the wishes and feelings of his own children. It's all something he is willing to throw by the wayside and just have them endure as long as he gets what he wants. Frankly, he's a pretty sick individual. But I think that it should also say something to us about how often enemies don't speak in open animosity, but in flattery. They try to ingratiate themselves to us. They don't come out and tell us that they're trying to kill us or they wish ill on us or whatever. They kind of play this game with us to where they act like they really like us and they act like they're our friends because that'll give them a better opportunity to stab us in the back later. Now, I hope that that's never happened to you. It's very rarely happened to me, and I consider myself fairly blessed that I've been surrounded by great people for the most part. But just keep that in mind, that as much as it's good to love, it's good to trust, it's good to give the benefit of the doubt whenever you can or you have good reason to, that this is an occasion where David is just flattered and, and so awestruck by the idea that he, a humble shepherd, would be favored by the king of Israel, not knowing that the reason that that is the case is because Saul's looking for an opportunity to murder him. And I do feel for David and Jonathan and, and Saul's two daughters, Michelle and uh, Merib, you got to feel for them because they're just being used as pawns in this man's game. It's really sad to see. You know, all sin is bad. That's obvious. We, we know that from the scripture over and over again. But intentionally dragging other people and just not caring what your sin does to them, I think that's got to be one of the worst kinds of sin that you can commit. Because a sin that just sort of accidentally hurts other people, that's still bad. It's still wrong. You should still know better. You still shouldn't do it. But one where you're the one intentionally facilitating dragging them into the 
and you're just perfectly fine with them getting hurt or just, on the other hand, utterly apathetic towards what it does to them. I think that that's a person that you've not only crossed over into the realm of sin, you may be in the realm of psychosis at this point. And I think at that point, you've just gone so far past any place of love and goodness, and we see that that's something that Saul really doesn't have in his life anymore from this point forward. He is so consumed and eaten up with pride and envy and paranoia that there's just nothing else in his life. No joy, no happiness. He can't even enjoy the crown that he continues to wear because he's so paranoid somebody is going to take it away from him. Did God do that to him as punishment? No. God didn't make him do all those things. You see, he did it to himself. When he stopped following God and stopped doing what God would want him to do, that's what Saul's life became. And it's truly tragic, but we can fall into this same problem. If we're not careful, then we too can fall into this, the kind of sin where we don't even care how it affects other people. That's a bad place to be. So if we want to avoid this, we have to do what Saul was unwilling to do. And that is to be obedient and consider how our actions affect others. And to, as the Bible commands, to esteem others better than ourselves. Stay the course, friends. It's not exactly a secret that YouTube really doesn't like conservatives, so I'm asking for your help. I don't want to stick it to them. I just genuinely want to show them that conservative voices do matter and that there is a big, passionate audience out there that wants to hear them. So give us a like and subscribe, remembering to click the notification bell, and show YouTube that you do want more content like this. Sincerely, thank you.